Okay, Assalamu Alaikum. Today we're going to be looking at Immanuel Kant, or perhaps I should say Immanuel Kant. Uh, because he was one of the most influential philosophers uh, of the 18th century and continues to be one of the most influential philosophers even today. At the epistemological level, Kant wanted to combine, on the one hand, the um, realist philosophers, the continental philosophers, such as uh, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, and so on, uh, with the empiricist philosophers, such as Locke, Hume, uh, and others, Bishop Barclay, and so on. The main distinction between the two was whether reality was to be understood deductively by access to the mind, or whether it was to be understood empirically by observation of facts and inductively. Uh, the way that Kant reconciled these two major schools of philosophical thought were to suggest that while on the one hand the thing in itself, whatever lies outside of us, is being perceived by us. Uh, on the other hand, it is only perceived by us through a series of intellectual lenses that we are born with. He called them a priori. He said these were a priori. Such as, for example, our conception of space and our conception of time. We were born with these conceptions. And we can only understand the, the so-called objective world through the lens of uh, the conceptions that we are born with. Hence, uh, in this particular way, Kant wanted to combine both empiricism as well with um, continental realism. Whether this synthesis was successful or not is a separate matter, but it was nonetheless hugely influential. But we are not so much concerned with Kant's understanding of uh, epistemology as we are concerned with his understanding of politics and of the Enlightenment in particular. Here again, he was very, very influential. Uh, his essay, What is Enlightenment, Enlightenment written in 1784, uh, is arguably the defining essay that helps us understand what this, uh, that helps us understand how liberal philosophy in particular defined the Enlightenment. It wouldn't be wrong on my part to consider Kant as being a liberal. Uh, in fact, his uh, views uh, not just with respect to his ethical theories, but even more importantly, his understanding of what constitutes freedom is so fundamental that you can see it continue right up to ideas in uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, you can see it in existential philosophy. You can also see it in postmodernism. So enlightenment is a particular period in European history where many ideas that were previously held to be sacrosanct came tumbling down and were challenged by the major thinkers uh, in Europe uh, uh, at the time. And of course, the central ideas of Europe at the time had to do with religion, had to do with Catholicism, had to do with Christianity. Enlightenment thinkers then began to challenge many ideas that were held near and dear. For over a thousand years, they began to challenge them. More importantly, they had the freedom, uh, the intellectual freedom at the time, to challenge these ideas. And therefore, they ended up creating a more scientific, rational understanding of how the world worked. And in politics, they ended up creating republics and eventually democratic states. So the man that defines the Enlightenment for us is this, is Immanuel Kant. He says, enlightenment, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self imposed immaturity. Man was immature and now man has become mature. Uh, man was childish in a certain sense and now we have emerged from our childishness to understand or to begin to understand how the world really works. He says, we must have the courage to use our own understanding. That is the motto of the Enlightenment. Aksar aapne suna hoga ke aapke teachers, vice chancellors, lums ke professors wagar aapko kehte honge ke the purpose of a lums education is that you should be able to think for yourself. This slogan has been used many times in academia, uh, also of course in newspapers and people who are democratic, uh, of a democratic dispensation continue to say to you, think for yourself, think for yourself. Critical thinking is what we want to develop. 
Well, the slogan, they may or may not know this, but the slogan really comes from all the way back from the 18th century. It comes from Immanuel Kant, and it is a testament to his influence that it continues to be one of the main slogans that we still use. And I, I think it is more or less a slogan uh, that we continue to use in academia today. He says, laziness and cowardice uh, have, were the characteristics of man before. Either we were too scared of thinking for ourselves, or we were too lazy to think for ourselves. We wanted somebody to give us a pakki pakai roti, ke hume bas bata de sir ke answer kya hai, aur usi ko hum reproduce karke final exam mein hum usko likh denge, aur sara mamla hal ho jayega. This is laziness. Either you really don't want to think for yourself because you know, you're too, bothered, too concerned about things that are intellectually lazy. These are hard things to figure out. You just want to figure out that if you have pizza in the evening, then pepperoni or chicken in the evening. If you have pizza, then you should have pizza from the heart or from Domino's. You know, uh, to think about the larger questions of life, uh, you know, what kind of state should we have? What does it mean to be good? How should one be a good person, a good citizen, uh, and so on and so forth? These kind of harder questions. How do we solve the economic problems of Pakistan? The how do we enfranchise people in Pakistan? As soon as somebody begins to talk about it, you say, oh my God, please, yaar, bas karo. let's turn on some Netflix and enjoy a nice movie, uh, you know, uh, and so on. So that's just plain intellectual laziness. You don't really want to address the bigger questions. And the second is cowardice. What do we mean by cowardice? Well, quite simply that we are scared of asking many of these questions. Why are we scared? Because, you know, our mother has taught us one thing, our mother has taught us one thing, our teachers have taught us one thing, we are listening to one thing, our father and father have taught us one thing. Now, if we challenge that thing, then the whole society will see you and say, oh, hi, what are you talking about? It's not like that. Our father has taught us one thing, our civilization has taught us one thing, our civilization has taught us one thing, and our society has taught us one thing. Why are you thinking differently from everybody else? It's a scary idea to think differently, to think really to think differently, is actually much more scary and terrifying than to act, than, than to you know um, well than to than to pretend like you're thinking differently. So you know you wear slightly different clothes or you wear your hair a slightly different way, etc. And you say, oh look, I'm so different from everybody else. But are you really? Uh, I mean, in terms of the life that you lead, uh, you know, you're really fitting into. The, are you really challenging, let's say, the division of labor, the way in which state and society works, the way in which we fundamentally think about the world? Are you really challenging that? Maybe you are, maybe you are not. But it is, you can understand that it is difficult to challenge these fundamental ideas of any given society. Kant continues, our guardians have made us think that taking the step to maturity is very dangerous and also very difficult. They have made their people dumb and dependent on the guardians. So it is in my interest as, a teach, as your teacher perhaps, as, your, as a figure in authority, that I will say this, that I have to read so many books. I have given you notes. Read them from these 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 notes. So, you know, it is easy for me as your intellectual guardian, uh, it is simpler for me as your intellectual guardian to instill in you the ethic that you must basically just ratify or learn what I have taught you. Don't question it, don't challenge it. If you begin to question me, if you begin to challenge me, then not only do you have to work harder, the problem is I have to work harder now to be able to answer your questions. That's why he jo bacha betha ba ke kya naam hai? Jab shah ka naam bhul jata hai, tasfim. Sahi kaha maine? Wow, I'm 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 feeling proud of myself. Isliye main chahta hoon ye late hi aaye class mein na aaye to better hai. Because he keeps challenging me, and of course, as your guardian, uh, that makes me work harder. And I don't want to work harder. I want to just come here, do my lecture, and go home, and that would be the end of that. Maybe I am a bit lazy. Maybe I can be a bit of a coward because when you ask me the tough questions, I have to give you answers that may not even make you happy and may not make those who are sitting outside of this classroom very happy. So Kant tells us that um, both cowardness, cowardice and laziness can cause us to look for easy answers. Only, he says, a few have succeeded in cultivating their minds and freeing themselves from immaturity. Most of us prefer to stay in this state of immaturity. Uh, there are a few people 
who break free. Uh, and of course, sadly, they also have to pay the price for breaking free. But it is this freedom, he says, that is the only way that we can achieve enlightenment. Nothing is required of you to gain this enlightenment except freedom. Nothing is needed from society except that the chains that are put in our minds, the chains that are put in our minds, that mental slavery, remove it, the rest of the work will be done. Don't worry about it. The freedom to use reason publicly in all matters. First of all, you give a society to a society that ریزن منطق کو استعمال کر سکے تمام مسائل کو حل کرنے کے لیے ریزن یو نو ہماری منطق کی قوت جو ہے وہ سوسائیٹی میں اگزس ضرور کرتی ہے مگر اس کی حدود مقرر کر دی گئی ہیں ہمیں یہ بتا دیا گیا ہے کہ ہاں ان سوالوں پہ آپ منطقی جواب ہم آپ سے جو ہے چاہتے ہیں مگر ان سوالوں پہ آپ نے ریزن ریشنل ریشنلزم لوجک کو استعمال نہیں کر رہا ان سوالوں پہ آپ کو میں نے جواب دے دیا ہے ان کا رٹا لگا لو اور بس یہی جواب ہے when there is freedom the few who can think for themselves will spread the spirit of rationality to everyone اگر آزادی دے دی جائے تو جو چند لوگ سوال واقعی منطق کو استعمال کر رہے ہیں اپنے ذہن کو استعمال کر رہے ہیں لوجک کو استعمال کر رہے ہیں ان کے خیالات خود بہت جو ہیں وہ سوسائیٹی کے اندر پھیل جائیں گے وہ طاقتور خیالات ہیں مگر جو پابندیاں لگائی گئی ہیں سوسائیٹی پہ ان پابندیوں کے نتیجے میں ہم ان لوجیکل آرگیمنٹس کو قبول کرنے کے لئے تیار نہیں ہیں because we fear the consequences اگر اس میں کوئی آپ کو فگر چاہیے پاکستان میں who is the champion of scientific rationality, reason and logic it would be of course somebody like Parvez Hoothboy who has been talking about this for decades that you know we need to uh, be able to think rationally and that is the only way in which we can create an enlightened Pakistan uh, uh, otherwise it's not possible the public of course attains enlightenment or can attain enlightenment slowly آہستہ آہستہ لوگ جو ہیں وہ نئی آرگیمنٹس کو قبول کریں گے but it is possible everywhere we see and he's not just talking about Pakistan he was talking about Europe at the time he says we can see restrictions on freedom do not argue they tell us بحث نہیں ہوگی یہاں پہ بلکہ کچھ کھوکوں پہ تو پاکستان کے اندر یہ بھی لکھا ہوتا تھا کہ یہاں پہ سیاسی بحث کرنا منع ہے ہوتلوں پہ اور کھوکوں پہ وغیرہ پہ لکھا ہوتا تھا کہ یہاں پہ سیاسی بحث کرنا منع ہے Do not argue, drill, says the officer. Bas parade karo, drill karo. Saamne se, chak te, chak, khatam ho gai baat. Do not argue, pay, says the tax man. Aaj kal National Accountability Bureau jo hai, wo sab ke dar pe chada hua hai. Aur usse agar aap yeh poochte hai ke, sir, aap ne saara kanun change karke yeh bana diya hai. Ke jo accused hai, jis pe ilzaam laga hai ke usne tax chori ki hai, us ko sabit karna padta hai ke wo innocent hai. You are guilty till proven innocent rather than being innocent till proven guilty. Which is a normal way in which courts proceed. The normal way in which courts proceed is ke it has to be established beyond a reasonable doubt that you have in fact stolen money from the government by not paying your taxes. But in the case of the National Accountability Bureau, the onus is on the accused. Agar aap ko ko khej ke liya hai naab ke andar, to wo kaega ke di, I think, aapka kya naam hai? Yes. Amna, I think you are living beyond your means. Ye bag jo aap ne uthaya hai, phone jo aap ne rakha hai, I don't think you could have, you can afford this in your income. Ab aur sabit karo ke vaakai aap ke pas itni aamdani hai ke jo cheezhe aap ne kharidi hai, wo aap kharid sakte hai. So the onus is on the other party. So do not argue, pay says the tax man. Of course this can also be uh, taken in the context of um, the, Ameri the famous slogan of the American Revolution. Unka kya slogan tha? No taxation without representation. اگر آپ آپ سے ٹیکس وصول کر رہے ہیں تو پھر ہماری نمائندگی بھی ہونی چاہیے سیاست بھی ہم ہی چلائیں گے So finally do not argue believe says the pastor you know and ہمارے ہاں بھی جو مذہبی پیشوا ہیں وہ بھی یہ کہتے ہیں کہ بحث نہیں کریں کچھ کچھ ویسے are very you know very different in this regard but اکثر سے اگر آپ سوال پوچھ لیں گے تو شاید وہ آپ سے کافی خفا ہو جائیں depend کرتا ہے سوال بھی کیا ہے اگر آپ کو ایسا سوال پوچھیں گے جو دین کے مذہب 
کے دائرے کے اندر ہے تو پھر تو وہ میرا خیال اعتراض نہیں کریں گے مگر اگر آپ کوئی ایسا سوال پوچھیں گے جو کہ وہ جس کے حوالے سے وہ یہ تصور کرتے ہیں کہ اس کے نتیجے میں ان قسم کے سوالات کے نتیجے میں آپ دین سے علیدہ ہو رہے ہیں تو پھر ظاہری بات ہے وہ آپ سے کافی خفا بھی ہوں گے اس کی تاریخ بھی ہے اور جہاں تک افکورس کیتھولک کرسٹیانیٹی کا تعلق ہے تو وہاں پہ تو آپ نے دیکھا کہ انکوزیشن وغیرہ جیسے خوفناہ کے دارے قائم کیے گئے اس مقصد کے لیے کہ لوگ جو ہیں وہ دین سے ذرا ادھر ادھر نہ ہوں What Kant wants in its place is the private and the public use of reason. What does that mean? Well, the private use of reason is employed for one's own ends. So private use means that maybe I want to make money, maybe I want fame and fortune, maybe I want to become associate professor, maybe I want X, Y, Z. What I will do is use reason for my private ends. These are private ends. These are not your ends, right? If I get rich, it has no impact on, well, it has no necessary impact on you. So it's for me that I'm doing this. So I can use reason for, the, for my private end. And generally we have seen that Uh, you are allowed to, even in the most uh, constrictive of society, you are allowed to use reason for a private end. یہ کوئی تبڑا مسئلہ نہیں ہے کہ اگر آپ اپنی فیکٹری لگاتے ہیں تو اس کو آپ چلانا چاہتے ہیں کوئی ریشنل طریقے سے اپنا کھوکھا لگاتے ہیں اپنا کریئر بنانا چاہتے ہیں اس میں آپ منطق کو استعمال کر رہے ہیں ریزن کو استعمال کر رہے ہیں کوئی بھی آپ پہ اس پہ اعتراض نہیں کرے گا. Um, Also, this can be restricted without endangering enlightenment. For instance, in civic posts or in office, for, uh, for instance, if you are a hukumati ahalkar and you are an officer of the law, then you have, to, you have to implement the law. You cannot implement your private reason in that particular instance. So it can be restricted in your case. You can say, Dr. Saab, here is your responsibility. You have to study the children of Western political philosophy. If you want to do other things, if you want to do it, تو وہ کر بھی سکتے ہیں آپ مگر یونیورسٹی آلسو ہیز اے رائٹ ٹو سے کہ سر سلیبس جو طے کی ہے جو کانٹریکٹ ہے بٹوین یو اینڈ دا اسٹوڈنٹس وہ ضرور کمپلیٹ کریں پھر اگر آپ کچھ اور کرنا چاہتے ہیں تو کر لیں پرووائڈیڈ اٹ اسٹیز ود ان دی ایتھیکل کوڈس سیٹ بائی لمس بائی دا یونیورسٹی کریکٹ سملرلی یو نو ایف یو آر اسٹارٹنگ ان اے اسکول اینڈ یو ٹیک اے فزکس کلاس اینڈ سمبڈی اسٹارٹ ٹیچنگ یو سم تھنگ اباؤٹ ایتھکس ایکسیٹرا یو مائٹ اٹ مائٹ بی اے ویری امپورٹنٹ لیسن بٹ آف کورس دی پرنسپل ول بی ان دا رائٹ ٹو سے سر پہلے فزکس پڑھا لیں پھر باقی چیزیں بعد میں کریں سو یو کین ریسٹرکٹ دا یوز آف ریزن ان پبلک آفس ایون مور امپورٹنٹلی آئی جسٹ کم ٹو یو ایون مور امپورٹنٹلی ایف یو آر اے پولیس آفیسر اور ایف یو آر این آفیسر آف دا لا ان دیٹ پرٹیکولر انسٹنس یو می تھنک دیٹ سم بڈی از انسینٹ اور سم بڈی از گلٹی یو می بی ایبسولوٹلی کنوینسڈ بٹ یو ہیو ٹو فالو دا پروسیجر آف دا لا یو ہیو ٹو اریسٹ دیم یو ہیو ٹو کٹ دی ایف آئی آر یو ہیو ٹو سبمٹ دی ایف آئی آر آل آف دیز تھنگس ہیو ٹو بی ڈن ایون وین یو تھنک دس پرسن از گلٹی از سن یو ہیو ٹو فالو واٹس کالڈ ڈیو پروسیس آف دا لا ان فیکٹ اگر ڈیو پروسیس فالو نہیں ہوا ان کنٹریز ویئر دا لا از ویری ویری اسٹرکٹ ایون اے گلٹی پرسن کین بی سیٹ فری ایون سم بڈی ہو از ایبسولوٹلی ایزیلی پروون ایز بینگ گلٹی کین بی سیٹ فری ایف The due process of the law has not been followed. Their lawyers can argue that okay, this was a mistrial. This was a situation in which due process was not followed. They can strike down evidence. They can say this evidence is not admissible in court because it was not acquired in the proper way through a due process, etc. Uh, this witness was coerced, etc., etc. They can blow that case apart if the law is not followed. Even though you as a private officer may feel that you may have seen the crime with your own eyes and you may feel that you have to follow the due process of the law. Yes. <laughs> How is it private? Yes, of course it would be a, a, a private end for an individual, but it would become a public end if you created a society which uh, was based on the pursuit of wealth. So that becomes something different from the private pursuit of wealth to, let's say, a capitalist system, you know, or a neoliberal system. That now becomes, moves from the private into the public realm because it becomes a concern for everybody. Uh, so a capitalist 
this week's bites, but they would say that my exploitation is a, a means to a private language to gain our wealth. Right. But a worker who was to try to be able to get more rights would be told that this the public in the prison it must be issued. It depends on what the demand is. So, for example, a group of capitalists or even an individual capitalist may ask the government to create certain labor laws, which are, let's say, uh, you know, allow for what we call flexible labor, right? Uh, now, in, the, in that particular instance, the capitalist is arguing for the law to be changed, for labor laws to be changed. Now, he may be motivated in the first instance because his own factory is impacted by it. But when, it, when he is demanding that a law be changed, that, of course, is the public use of, uh, that is, of course, a public idea that is, impacts the public as a whole. So your motivation may be private, but, the, but what you're demanding is something that becomes a public concern, correct? Uh, similarly, a worker may ask for labor laws to be uh, more, st more strict with respect to providing old age benefits and pensions and so on. Now they again may be motivated for a very private end, which is that But of course, when, when you argue the case that the, there should be an eight hour workday, that is a public case to be made. It impacts all of society, not just you individually. So the public and private use of reason, or, the, or public and private ends, wherever private ends have an impact on people other than yourself, they of course become public ends. And wherever something only has an impact on you, and I can refer you back to John Stuart Mill, who was saying, you know, as long as you're not harming anybody else, you can do what you like, right? Um, and that's your freedom under a liberal idea. So as long as um, what you are, uh, what you are trying to get to is not impacting anybody else in any negative or positive way. It cannot, it, it's purely a private end and you are allowed to use reason, but you are, we are, can also restrict your reason. We can also restrict you in certain instances, especially where, if you are an officer of the law. But the public use of reason, yes? Sir, for Kant, is the process of enlightenment inevitable or does he set any precondition for it? No, he is setting a precondition for it. The precondition for it is, of course, Freedom. If you do not have intellectual freedom, then you cannot get to the enlightenment. So you could be stuck in that situation for centuries, uh, po potentially. Uh, uh, if, if the necessary freedom is not created, then you will never achieve an enlightened society. Or if the necessary conditions are created for freedom, you could achieve it very early on in history. It depends on the circumstances. There is no teleology as such in Kant about the achievement of enlightenment. So um, the officer on duty must obey, but a scholar should not be constrained from making comments about errors in military service. Oh Lord, or from placing them before the public for his judgment. The public use of reason, he's saying, includes scholarship. This is one of the most important things that we must allow is for scholars, thinkers, uh, intellectuals, uh, philosophers, to be able to exercise their scholarship in a manner which is able to criticize the powers that exist at the time. What's the point in criticizing powerless people? You know, for example, if somebody is a, I, I, I have made a video paste of this woman who is sitting in between two railway cars, and she's holding her baby, and apparently she traveled 100 kilometers in between two railway cars. Which is a place where there are hooks and chains in between two rail cars. She was sitting there holding almost a newborn baby in her arms. You know, and she took her hand on her hand so that she didn't fall off. And she went 100 kilometers that way to uh, get her baby to a hospital. Now the thing is, if I criticize this woman, this woman is so powerless that she can't even find a seat on a train. She can't even get a ticket on the train. She's that powerless. So what's the point of utilizing my reason to criticize somebody who cannot even help their own child? They're so powerless. Obviously, to change society, to reform society, you have to point your fingers at those who take the decisions, the major decisions for society. And those are the people who are powerful. And those are the very people who don't want to be criticized, who don't want to be challenged, but without criticizing them, without challenging them, without looking at 
you know, the policies they've made and how those policies have impacted society, you can't really change society. So scholarship always has to basically, you know, sort of focus on the major decisions, policies, structure of society, and therefore ends up in some way or the other, uh, uh, you know, challenging those who are powerful. Or at least must be allowed to challenge those who are powerful, because otherwise it would be pretty useless. So uh, maybe, he says, an appointed teacher cannot use his reason because they are appointed to teach a particular subject. But a cleric, as a scholar, must have unrestricted freedom. Scholars, as a whole, must have unrestricted freedom. That the spiritual guardians of the people should themselves be immature is an absurdity that would ensure the perpetuation of absurdities. Matlab, jin logo ne soch bichar karke aapko enlightened karna hai, aapko, kya kehte hai, soi hui neen se jagana hai, khas taur pe aapko, thik hai na ji? To agar wo khudhi so jai, aap ne to logo ko jagana tha, madam, agar aap khudhi so jai, to that would cause the, that would be an absurdity that would cause the perpetuation of further absurdities. So, the public use of reason is absolutely necessary for society to move forward. Can any oath or contract restrict the public use of reason? Such a contract, Kant says, whose intention is to preclude forever all further enlightenment of the human race is absolutely null and void even if it should be ratified by the supreme power, by parliaments, and by the most solemn peace treaties. Aisa koi muayda kabul kabool nahi hai, jo puri ki puri insaniyat ko raat ki tariqi ke andar dabo de. Samjhe? To aisa koi contract jo hai, wo kabul kabool nahi. It would be a crime against human nature. Insan ki fitrat ke khilaaf yek jurm hai, whose essential destiny lies in progress. Tarakki humara fariza hai. To, or humara haq hai. Humari destiny, humari manzil hai. Any individual may put off enlightenment temporarily for themselves. Bhai, aapne nahi enlightened ho na, thik hai, so jau, mujhe nahi parwa. But to renounce it forever or for other generations is to violate and trample man's divine rights underfoot. Ye to bhoat hi zulm ho ziyati ho ki. Agar aap scholarship pe, public use of reason pe pabandiyan laga de, to ins, aap ye basically keh rahe hain ke insani tarakki pe aap pabandiyan laga rahe hain. Iska ye matlab nahi ke har banda jo tanqeed kar raha hai, wo durust tanqeed kar raha hai. Magar iska ye matlab zaroor hai ke us tanqeed ke baghair, us public scholarship ke baghair, jo kisi zamane ke, kisi wakt ke andar jo taqatwar kuwate hain, unko challenge kiye baghair, hum, ya jo policies hain, Unko challenge kiye bagar, samaj tarakki nahi kar sakta. Do we live in an enlightened age, he asks? No, we don't. But we do live in an age of enlightenment. We are moving. Abhi hamne enlightenment haasil nahi ki, magar hum uski taraf safar zaroor kar rahe, hum uski taraf bar zaroor rahe. A leader who allows men complete freedom in religious matters is himself enlightened and deserves to be prayed, praised. Sorry. Aisi kyaadat jo kahe ki thik hai. تنقید کرو میں قبول کرتا ہوں میں اتفاق نہیں کروں گا آپ سے ضروری نہیں کہ میں اتفاق کروں مگر میں آپ کا حق نہیں چھینوں گا کہ آپ مجھ پہ تنقید کریں اور ایسے قائد کو جو ہے ہمیں we should praise such a ruler only a ruler who is not afraid of his own shadow can say argue as much as you want and about what you want but obey جب قانون بن جائے تو پھر آپ نے اس پہ آپ بحث ضرور کر سکتے ہیں مگر قانون توڑ نہیں سکتے آپ ٹھیک ہے آپ یہ ضرور کہہ سکتے ہیں کہ یہ قانون درست نہیں ہے مگر جب تک قانون قائم ہے اس وقت تک آپ نے قانون کی پاسداری بھی کرنی ہے آپ نے قانون کو obey بھی کرنا ہے but then you can argue the case that this law for example is discriminatory against women or it is discriminatory against African Americans or against religious minorities or against workers etc and it ought to be changed that freedom should be there so freedom and the dignity of man are absolutely connected. Without freedom, man cannot lead a life of real dignity. Government, governments and the powers that be will always profit by treating men who are now more than machines in accordance with their dignity. 
انسان کو اگر ڈگنیٹی سے ٹریٹ کیا جائے اس کے اپینین کی ریسپیکٹ کی جائے اس کے ڈیفرنس آف اپینین کی ریسپیکٹ کی جائے ایسی حکومتیں جو ہیں وہ مزید زیادہ طاقتور ہو سکتی ہیں کیونکہ ایسی حکومتیں ایسی سوسائیٹیز پیدا کرتی ہیں that are able to think for themselves that are able to reason for themselves and that are able to progress as a result of the use of reason this here is a coin that was made commemorating the 250th birthday of Immanuel Kant. That ends my lecture on the Enlightenment. Any questions so far? How clear are you? Do you understand what Enlightenment is? Yes. So, sir, when Kant says that a vector of the that distinction exists not just in the time of Immanuel Kant but exists in our society even today there is a distinction between those who are who earn their uh, living by intellectual labor versus the those who earn their living by manual labor that's not a distinction that exists as a consequence of our conceptions it's a distinction that exists as a consequence of the way in which the economy operates so just to say okay, oh i don't consider any distinction between intellectual and manual labor will not make the actual existing existence uh, the actual existence of the division of mental and manual labor go away just because you refuse to acknowledge it doesn't mean it goes away right this is a very important argument because we often think that this distinction exists because they are mere conceptions in our mind and if we knock them out of our mind then they'll be knocked out of society for example we will often think that if we knock out racist ideas or sexist ideas from our mind then sexism will collapse, racism will collapse because intellectually we won't be supporting racist ideas or intellectually we won't be supporting sexist ideas. But does patriarchy collapse merely because you stop thinking in a patriarchal way? Do you think it collapses? Or is its power rooted in the economy? Is its power rooted in the position and status that women occupy? Not bec only because I think of women in a certain way, but rather the other way. It is already because women are powerless that I can think of them as powerless. So, so try and understand before you ask another question. Is it that women are powerless because men think of them as powerless? Or is it that men think of them as powerless because in reality women are powerless? Because the two have very different consequences as an activist, right? As an activist, if you think women are powerless in reality in the, in the economic sphere, then like Virginia Woolf you would say, that in order for women to have freedom, the precondition of that would be economic independence. If women have economic independence, then they would become, as many men do, if they have that real economic independence, they're not dependent on other men for their livelihood, then they would automatically become more powerful. That's one argument. That's one branch of feminist activism, right? Or Marxist or socialist feminist activism goes along that way. There's another branch which says, no, no, that's Yes, of course we want economic empowerment, but the real focus ought to be on conceptions of that men, certain conceptions, patriarchal conceptions about women. And they may be conceptions that men have, they obviously benefit men, but they may also be conceptions that women have that don't benefit women. Right? Women may hold conceptions that hurt themselves. People can often hold conceptions that hurt themselves. Right? In which instance, we focus all our energy on challenging those conceptions. But Maybe we don't really focus too much energy on economically empower women, right? The two have very different consequences. So which is it? Is it that women were economically weak as a consequence of which all these conceptions about their weakness in other spheres of life are the product of, the, of that real economic division of labor where women are basically domestic servants, wives are domestic servants? If that is the division of labor, then we would see conceptions arise on the basis of that. Or is it the other thing? Is it that they became weak because we had certain conceptions of them and that reduced them to domestic slaves? For example, with African slavery. Is it that, or, or, or rather racism? Is it that, race, that you know, some people went and took, 
12, 13 million black people, slaves from the African continent and use them on uh, plantation colonies, etc. that gave rise to the conceptions of racism as justifications for that particular action? Or is it that racism is merely a mental construct? Of course, it is a mental construct. There's no doubt about it. It is a social construct. Uh, and, but if we just get rid of the social construct, the mental construct, and we think of black and white people as being you know, equal, etc. But we don't undo that old division of labor which rendered African-American people at the lowest rungs of society, as mainly the working people of that country. We don't undo that division of labor. Do you expect that racism will disappear? So that's what, so Kant is not creating, in defense of Kant, I would say, Kant is not creating the distinction between mental and manual labor. He is merely observing that that distinction already exists. What he is further saying is that those who are scholars, those who are thinkers, those who are philosophers, those who have spent their, the, all the decades of their life trying to understand how state, the state works, how society works, how the economy works, how politics works, how ethics works, how uh, you know, so, 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 you know, have studied sociology, have studied all these uh, matters between men and women, between workers and capitalists and um, slaves and plantation owners, and you know, looked at the history of Pakistan, etc., 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 etc. If now you tell them, ke, haan ji, research shuru kare, magar usme se natija ye nikalna chahiye ke military ka budget badha diya jaye. Ya research shuru kare, magar usme se natija ye hi nikalna chahiye ke uh, is council of Islamic ideology jo hai, wo hi kanun banaye. Theek hai, research shuru kare, magar usme se natija ye hi nikalna chahiye ke PMLN, PTI ya People's Party ki hukumat banaye. जो भी वो आप उसको कहें, जिस भी जिस भी डब्बे के अंदर आप उसको फिट करना चाहें, अच्छा हो या बुरा हो, ये लेता बहस है, मैं ये नहीं कह रहा कि ये बुरा है अच्छा है, अच्छा हो या बुरा हो, पहले से ही अगर आप पाबंद कर दें अपनी इंटेलेक्चुअल क्लास को कि ये नतीजा निकालना है, फिर मैं आपको ये uh, of your society. Ya phir aap usko dhande ke zor se kahe ki agar isse koi aur neetija nikala to tum missing ho jaoge. Theek hai na? To agar aap paband kar dein apni intellectuals ko ke bhai ye cheeze aap soch sakte hain wo cheeze aap nahi soch sakte. Chahe wo khauf ke zariye ho ya wo lalach ke zariye ho. To phir aap apni hi society ko deny kar rahe hain wo opportunity ke wo society jo hai unki scholarship aur unki research se aur unki intellect se aur unke kaam se benefit kar sake. Ho sakta hai ki aap individually benefit nahi karenge. Isliye shayad aap usko mana kar rahe hain. Magar society benefit karegi. Aur agar aap wasil kalbi se thoda sa is pe gaur kare, broad minded ho ke sara gaur kare, agar society benefit karegi, to bhai jaan phir aap bhi benefit karenge. Theek hai na? Fauri taur pe shayad nahi aap benefit kare, magar long term mein aapko bhi benefit hoga uska. That's what Kant is trying to say that a society as a whole benefits from allowing its thinkers the freedom to use reason uh, for public ends. If you allow that, then society will progress. Yes? How is Khan saying that those individuals will benefit? Because if I have that money and my interest lies in maintaining the status quo, I wouldn't want to invest in research that would try to dismantle that. Sure. Uh, actually, Khan didn't say that. I kind of supplemented him <laughs> by saying that. Um, but I think one can understand and accept. I mean, he, he does say, for example, a government will profit by treating men who are now more than machines in accord with their dignity. So that's the argument I'm supplementing. That uh, a society, when a society becomes stronger, maybe I will lose temporarily for five, 10 years. But when, in, as a consequence of changing certain economic policies, <coughs> the whole of society becomes incredibly prosperous, then I will also get a share of that prosperity, will I not? My children will enjoy a safer society, a cleaner society, a better society, a more advanced society. For just, just take as an instance that you may be the top dog in a third world country, but being the top dog in a third world country, certainly you rule over a lot of people, etc. But you are the top dog of a very, of a very poor country. You may not be the top dog in a rich country, but you can understand that in an advanced country, 
uh, if you're upper middle class, you can enjoy a life which is far more enriching than even rulers can enjoy in a very desperately poor country. So you do benefit from that, from that way. Maybe not in the short run, but in the long run. So that's the kind of argument that Kant is making. That in fact, all of society, we have to think more about the, you know, all of society moving together. To paraphrase or to use a quotation by John F. Kennedy, a rising tide lifts all boats, right? So, you know, so if society as a whole improves, prospers, benefits, becomes more enlightened, all boats will rise up, including yours. But if you, if you make it such that uh, that policies are benefiting one section of society at the expense of the overall growth and development of society, that, that's, not, that's, not very, that's not a very enlightened way to, 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 to run a society. That, I think, is Kant's argument. Yes. But isn't he saying that uh, the in the system is follow it, but it doesn't preclude you from criticizing it? That is correct. That is absolutely correct. He is not calling upon you to break the law and take the law into your own hands and, and so on. But he is merely calling upon uh, the powers that be in his time to, for, for, to give society and its thinkers the, the right to rethink the law, to think about it all of, you know, and to, to the right to challenge it, to the right to be able to uh, uh, come up with better laws. And I think that's a pretty, you know, um, I think that's a, that's a reasonable argument. And of course, we can think of certain we can think of, think of certain laws in in this uh, country. There are there are certain laws in this country that protect other laws in this country from being challenged intellectually, right? So there are laws that protect other laws. There are laws about you know uh, there are laws about certain things, right? Uh, challenging certain ideas, challenging certain laws, and then there are laws about anybody trying to challenge those ideas or those laws. You understand what I'm saying? And so Kant is saying we have to allow the freedom to be able to debate these things. 